Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. We're, um, we're ready to get started for uh, today's Grand Round session. But before we do, I would like to extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you here in the Class of 62 Auditorium, as well as online, to the first talk of this year's Grand Round season of the academic year. Was that a woo? Thank you. That's so exciting. Our residents are so excited for Grand Rounds. So this is the kickoff event. And um, per usual, we are opening with a state of the department given by Dr. Lee. But before I introduce him and set him up for his talk, I just want to remind us all of a few housekeeping items. Um, number one, you'll notice in the Zoom behind me that the presentation is currently being captioned. What we don't have today for reasons that I'm not 100% sure of, is interpreters. Uh, typically, they would be present here on Zoom to provide in vivo interpretation. Um, what we will have available at the conclusion of today's session is the captioned recording of today's session, but my apologies, I will find out what happened with our interpreter services, but we don't seem to have them at the moment. The second um, is that we will have some time, I think, at the end for Q&A with Dr. Lee regarding his presentation today. So I would encourage you to develop questions, thoughts, reflections, uh, whether here in the room or online, and I will moderate that discussion at the end. The last is that at the conclusion of today's session, you will be mailed an evaluation if you're attending by Zoom and you registered. Uh, if you're here live, there will be a QR code behind me as well as at the exits for the room that you should be able to scan on your way out. And that uh, QR code will bring you to the evaluation link. That evaluation is really important, not just for today's session, but for all of our sessions to ensure number one, that we are staying true to our mission and our guiding lights for uh, these grand round sessions in terms of the content as well as the applicability to our day-to-day -day work, um, as well as any other concerns that you might have. It's a great vehicle to let us know. Um, and last but not least, it enables you to get continuing education credit if that's something uh, that's important to you and needed for your certification, which for most of us it is. I'm pleased to say that for just about everybody in the room, we do offer continuing education credit for these sessions. Each of these is approved for uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, n I, I don't know about nurses, I think not nurses, social work, marriage and family, mental health counseling, and KSAC, and psychology. Have I forgotten anybody? Not yet. Okay, good. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lee uh, up to the podium so he can begin letting us know about the year in retrospect and what lies ahead for our department. Dr. Lee? Thank you, Sipora, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, but this is my annual State of Department talk, and, uh, and I, I, at the end, I want to also talk a little bit about how we want to continue testing our boundaries of psychiatry and, uh, and also thinking about our values. Uh, and I want to also use this talk as a prelude to year-long discussion about values of psychiatry. And I'll explain what that means. Um, but before I do that, I, I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank everybody who, who supported me for the past week. Many of you know that, that my mom passed away about a week ago, and last Saturday was my mom's uh, funeral. So it, it did come to my head that maybe I shouldn't do this grand round and postpone it a week or two. But, you know, I, I wanted to be home first and foremost. And I wanted to see everybody and, and talk to my friends. And so I'm very glad to be here. My mom passed away at peace uh, at the age of 88. She had such a, a full life. She was born in 1936 during World War II. Uh, uh, lived through Korean War, uh, uh, immigrated to the United States in 1982. And the funeral uh, was last Saturday, as I mentioned, uh, which took me a while to organize, and I did the eulogy at the funeral. And that also made me think about what I do and what I wanted to talk to you about. And uh, because, like, as I was writing her eulogy, she really lived a life like a gift 
to others. And, uh, you know, she never expected anything from anyone. She only just gave. And somehow that was good enough for her because her last words to everybody, uh, to our family, was was expression of gratitude. She thanked everybody uh, in my last conversation along with the rest of the family uh, 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 as she died in peace. And along with that is, is what I was also want to talk about besides talking about the state of the department. We'll, we'll do the usual thing, focusing on clinical service, research, education, and, and about community. But it's also made me think about, uh, you know, the numbers and stats and what we are doing is important, but the meaning is just as important. And that's what I wanted to also talk about in our, uh, in our uh, uh, talk today. You know, when I first came here about, I guess now, th this is my eighth year, believe it or not, and uh, seven years ago, um, I really stressed how I envisioned our department as a community, a community of like-minded people who wants to advocate for uh, people with mental illness through research, through clinical work, through education, in, in all the things that we do, uh, besides you know, all the staff and you know, everyone. And then I worked really hard to establish uh, the values first. And then I brought it out of George Engel's essential trait of somebody who is a clinician, the, the four C's he talked about, communication, complementarity, collaboration, and competence. And then, then I added compassion because, you know, after all, we had an advocacy department for the mentally ill patients. And, uh, and that consists, those are our five C's, our values. And we want to have a, a chance to talk about, you know, how does that relate to our work? Because I've come to realize how important it is to find fulfilling fulfillment in your daily work and 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 i'll make that argument through the talk um our department 2024 the state of department we keep expanding you know it seems like we keep expanding no matter what we do and uh, the, the, the latest addition is our addiction psychiatry division which i'm very proud of now headed by caroline easton and Myra Mathis, and, and we also, with realizing how important and large our ambulatory service, it's long overdue that we appointed George Nasra as our new uh, associate chair of ambul adult ambulatory care. And that, you know, you know is, is something that we've been planning and long overdue. And our addiction psychiatry division that just started as of July is off to an excellent start already with 90 total uh, staff and faculty with Caroline Easton as well, our new recruit. You know, it's, it's anchored also by our recovery center of excellence, our HRSA funded, uh, the National Center for Rural Mental Health in Substance Abuse. And, and, and it is becoming, it will, by, you know, it will become a premier division around the country, I'm sure, in, in no time. With this much growth in our department, one thing that Patrick has done wonderfully well, our, our Chief Administrative Officer Patrick Setch has done wonderfully well, is to really develop a new administrative framework, or more enhanced administrative framework to support our divisions and missions and clinical programs better. So we are now in the process of keep expanding our administrative structure to develop better oversight, better support for you to develop your own visions as individual clinicians and researchers and teachers and et cetera. That will fuel even more growth of our department. And that's something that we are all looking forward to Department of Psychiatry, 
uh, today is, as you know, it's a two campus, four uh, centers uh, in relation to the, the, uh, the type of patients that we serve, along with many other smaller clinics and sites. And we probably ran out of space probably two years ago already. And we probably need another building at some point. And, and, and to just illustrate the point, George Nazra just informed me we just completed the purchase of a, a well-known addiction program called Westphalus Associates, which will be part of probably our collaborative care and wellness division with support from addiction psychiatry division and, and will gradually, at some point, I, I do hope that it will migrate toward a Sully's Trail uh, where we have our new uh, uh, CCW headquarters. Um, one big thing that also happened, as you know, is the Brighter Day Pediatric Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center that opened in July 15th. And, you know, it is something that was very exciting and still being talked about. And, and, and Michael Sharp has worked so hard along with other division leaders to make this happen. There was a tremendous support from the community. And uh, uh, it, it, we're already seeing a tremendous uh, impact in overall quality of care for uh, pediatric patients, our children with acute behavioral health crisis. And, 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 We'll have to see how it impact, impacts our overall uh, patient flow in our CPAP. But, you know, one person, that one child that we can avoid sending to CPAP is definitely worth it. And, and we are very excited. We will see how this develops because once September hits, which is already this week, uh, the, 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 the flow of the child, uh, children into our CPAP really changes. And we are, we are beginning to track that. Um, our, you know, we are already going ahead and, and continuing to work on the expansion of our 49200 uh, adult psychiatric bed that will be opened by 2025. That will also uh, reduce the number of the, uh, patients in the bolded, uh, bolded patient in our CPAP. And, and that's another thing that we are very much looking forward to. And I cannot say enough thank you to our CPAP staff. Time to time, I go down and how they courageously work with these patients in such a challenging circumstances. But it's not just the CPAP staff that makes this happen. Uh, it's also our inpatient unit attendings and staff who are able to move the patient quickly to create you know, it's best for them to be moved up along with all of our mobile crisis and crisis hotlines and ambulatory care workers who are able to really serve these patients. There's just so many things. Our Department of Clinical Services really represents teamwork in mental health. I think about a couple of years ago, we talked about smart growth. We thought that we will slow down our uh, ambulatory care volume, but it, it does look like we are getting closer and close to half a million encounter per year. And I really cannot think of a single hospital-based psychiatry program that's anywhere near what we are doing in the country. And, uh, and this increase in volume is both in the child side as well as adult side. And there is also an interesting trend. It is primarily increasing in-person visits that's going up, while the telepsychiatry visits are going slowly going down. And this might be due to the fact that we have far more competitors in our market, like Better Health, Amazon, uh, Amazon Care, and, and others. But we'll see. We don't have to be everything to everybody. But goodness, we are trying. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons as to why, uh, why we have now new leaders to provide a strategy and vision for our military care uh, that is, is gigantic. Uh, George Nazra, as the division, uh, as the uh, associate chair, and Christine McDonald is the lead administrator 
will create a better flow, flow better coordination, and, uh, uh, and really think about how we can meet the needs of our community in a smarter way, as well as thinking about leveraging informatics and technology as Kayla Hunt is also going to start as our, our chief technology officer. There is also an interesting trend. Now, everybody has a different explanation. Now, this is not a trend that happens on every region. It's partly related to the fact that how much we have grown our overall ambulatory care to reduce the need for acute psychiatry visit is probably one of the reasons as to why we have CPAP that looks to be actually going down in terms of a volume. We began to see the trend, and the trend is actually at least seems to be continuing until, uh, for, the, for the first eight months. So, and it's equally in child psychiatry as well as in adult psychiatry. Across the board, there's about 5.3% reduction. After seeing about 8 to 10% increase every year, this is the first year we are actually seeing reduction in terms of visit in number of, uh, of these patients. And then we're going to, as I mentioned, the impact of the pediatric behavioral health urgent care is something we're going to carefully uh, observe and, and we're going to see. Crisis call line is probably also responsible for some of the reduced volume. We are now fielding about 21,000 calls a year, and that's, that's about 18% increase. And, uh, uh, and, and along with that is also the, the mobile crisis team that seems to be also increasing every year in terms of number and continuing to divert patients. Approximately 90 plus percent of the patients seen by mobile crisis team are diverted away from uh, CPAP to more appropriate care in the ambulatory care uh, programs. And, and that's something that we should be very proud of. And, uh, and, and, and it, it's one of the things that we have done in terms of diversifying what we offer to the psych acute patients that has really successfully reduced these numbers, particularly in the child psychiatry area. It is a unique story. It was a unique story last year. It continues to be a unique story this year in terms of how we have actually uh, changed the curve of the overall visit volume of child psychiatry. And it's the amazing work of our child psychiatry leadership along with the community leaders uh, who, who chipped in to help out in terms of creating our ambulatory care center for children and now the urgent care that we might be one of the very few EDs that's seeing reduction. Although I did hear now they're beginning to see some trend and, uh, and the child psychiatry unit also continues to have actually beds available, believe it or not. And it, it remains one of the only few uh, inpatient units in, at University of Rochester that actually is 80 to 85 percent occupant. And all these things we have learned, and at some point, I do hope that we can apply these lessons to the, uh, to the adult population so that we can do the same. We can learn from our ch uh, child colleagues and, uh, uh, and, 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 and be able to do the same. And, uh, and, and, and along with that is we continue to expand our uh, faculty numbers. Now, we are really complicated in terms of our number of the faculty. And when I ask Kim Swinter, who runs our faculty support office, what is the size of our faculty? She comes up with some numbers like 320, because it includes some of the voluntary faculty members, TAR faculty members, and uh, you know, variety of faculty members, adjunct faculty members. But overall, all of them are contributing to missions of our department. And all of them, our faculty support office provides support. And uh, if you just count the new part-time and full-time faculty members, we have 21. And uh, uh, since January 2024, because in the last eight months. And our orientation for faculty becomes really complicated because they 
are about to invite about 30 something faculty members so far, but I know there's about five more faculty members on the dock in terms of waiting for their signatures and the offer letters. And we are very much balanced. One thing that I'm very proud, and this is the vision of Rochester Psychiatry, is that we are multidisciplinary. We are 50-50 between the physicians and PhDs. And we also have economists, we also have lawyers, we also have education specialists, and along with many others that, that, I, that I probably forgot about. And then somewhere along the line is, uh, is the legacy of George Engel, who emphasized teamwork in, 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 in team care, in, in, in providing care for our patients. Our success of our research program is, 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 is envy of every department at University of Rochester. Overall, our academic budget have hit $32 million now. And, and according to uh, School of Medicine Finance, which represents the finance related to research and education, we are the only clinical department now is in the positive margin. In the, in the across the 32 institutes and, uh, and uh, the clinical departments. That means we do have a room to invest. That means that we will particularly invest on education. And that's something that, that I'm committed to do this year as we are actually uh, having a pause in terms of research recruit for this year and, and be able to really look into it. And the grants and contracts have hit 25 million, and our uh, NIH grants have gone up to 8.5 million. That's a $2 million plus. And it's really uh, our overall, uh, uh, in terms of our financial side of it, is led by our Recovery Center of Excellence, funded by HRSA, uh, that $16.5 million grant is, is something that we have. It's just one slide that actually shows a snapshot of how much we, our HRSA program has been going as the, one of the three uh, national sites for rural uh, addiction issues, and that really aims to stop the tide of opioid epidemic. And many of the people who are involved here are involved. Uh, Gloria Bashwitz and Michelle Lawrence have led it. They have now uh, uh, you know, turned the buttons now to Caroline Easton and Leah Sharafim. And, uh, and Alex Barrett has done such a wonderful job in terms of uh, leading this program over the past years and will continue to press on. Our Department of Psychiatry is clearly a department that you know, is an, it's more than anything. We are our identity is an academic clinical department and I continue to highlight the role of teachers as it relates to our mission, as well as our vision. It's the education excellence is something that we are stressing. And uh, as we think about how we wanna train team-based humanistic care driven by cutting edge science and the people who can deliver them, it's something that we're gonna be really looking at together. And this year, I'm very much uh, involved. In fact, I'm actually in charge of the entire residency recruitment this year uh, to, to, with, with a lot of assistance from Mark Nichols and, and Jeff Eiler and others. And it's something that I'm very much looking forward to because we, we have to rely on our education program, our postdoc psychology programs, pre-doc psychology programs, as well as the family therapy, uh, master's degree programs and other programs, KSACs and et cetera, they all have to be our pipeline to support the, the missions that we serve. You know, in order to do that, we, I talked a little bit about how we wanna enhance, are we working on enhancing our administrative framework? Our administrators provide the backbone of our department and make our vision realized in our daily work. And uh, we just hired our new administrative three, Paula Van Minos, and uh, uh, she's the new assistant director of business administration of education and faculty affairs. 
And uh, she'll be overseeing all of our education and training program as well as the FSO faculty support office. And that's a big, huge job that we are very much looking forward to onboarding and working closely together, along with Michelle Russo, who started several months ago as the new administrator for GME, who is supported also, who is working closely with Christine Liari, who is our uh, residency coordinator. And our search, external search for residency programs, the first external search through the search company that we have conducted uh, in our probable history of our program. And through the task force that was co-chaired by Yates Conner and Carol Pogorski, we have a very ambitious plan this year, also the faculty mentorship and career development. So the peer mentoring uh, program is something that we are exploring in order to develop a pipeline of not only qualified, but accomplished mentors in our department. Because as we developed more and more younger, uh, we recruited more and more junior faculties, you know, every department wants to do a pyramid shaped uh, faculty uh, look, uh, but our department is really bottom heavy. And we are really lacking the mid career mentorship. And that's something that we are committed to develop over the next year. Uh, start developing next year. It'll be years of uh, work that will be done. But, but, but Carol and Yates have provided a framework by which that we will uh, invest as well as we'll follow. And also, there have been also a lot of discussion for providing faculty members, which will also, also uh, benefit the trainees and staff involved in terms of providing seminars in terms of providing opportunities to develop careers by providing skills necessary to uh, succeed in academic medicine. And we'll be doing that probably pretty soon, uh, starting with the research skills seminars as well as education skills seminars and et cetera that will start. And, and faculty members will have a calendar of offering that they will be able to freely attend. Our DEI agenda, I'm not going to go into it, uh, much detail, but I think the recent re leadership appointment at University of Med Rochester Medical Center essentially speaks for itself. Telba Oliveres is now the Senior Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, Adrian Allen is Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion for Undergraduate Medical Education. Caroline Nestro, although she moved to School of Nursing, I still count her as one of ours, is the director of DEI for the UR Medicine Affiliate Hospital. Uh, essentially, she uh, oversees the DEI issues related to staff, uh, non-faculty, non-trainee staff for the overall medical center staff. And Diane Morse is now in charge of uh, health equity research. And I think, you know, for whatever that we have done and we have not done, at the minimum, I think we at least developed leaders through our department. And the problem is, of course, holding on to them is the, is the difficulty that we have faced now. But overall, now we have seen them leading. And hopefully, what we have done in psychiatry will be able to look at that as a potential benchmark in terms of what other departments should Think about trying out things like brown bag series, things like DEI grand rounds, things like how we changed our hallways, things like how we have developed an office of dice. All of them, I'm sure other departments can do as well. And uh, it's something that we will continue to push and bring to the attention of other departments and medical center leaders. Okay. I'm going to pause a little bit. The reason that I wanted to pause is that this is around where I, I kind of was thinking about, wow, that's a lot of expansion. But why are we doing all this? Is something that I kind of thought about. You know, why is it important to do all this? And 
And that brings back to the question of what is the meaning of all this? I mean, you know, death in the family does have a way of bringing back to kind of thinking about what is the meaning in all this. It's not all these numbers, it's not all this revenue, or it's not all these hiring and people going in and out and, 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 and et cetera. But out of all this, it, it is a reminder of in terms of what, what is it that we, we should be doing. And that brought me back. Why are we doing all these expansion? If you look at the standard definition of psychiatry, Psychiatry, you know, branch of medicine that deals with mental illness, you know, people's thoughts, moods, and behavior rather than in their skins and bones and viscera. Um, now, our department, now those who are in our department is not quite aware how strange our department is until you go outside of our department. Now, when I first came to our department seven years ago, I quickly noticed this is a very odd department. What do you mean that you take care of medical issues in severe mental illness? What do you mean you have programs like intimate partner violence and, and all these things? It took me a while, but now I'm, I'm completely going along with you in terms of keep expanding the boundaries of psychiatry these days. A lot of things about our department is unusual. Dementia care, we do almost all of the dementia care, not neurology, not geriatric medicine. All of it is under our division of geriatric psychiatry, mental health, mental wellness. And the AD care program, Finger Lake Center of Excellence, that's already the beginning of the all the aspect of our department that's testing the boundary medicine and psychiatry, we are the only one in the country. And we are very proud of it. And that is the leg legacy of biopsychosocial model as envisioned by uh, George Enger. And we'll continue to expand, invest, and do our best to make it into a national model. EAP, the employee-based health programs that oversees the wellness and, and behavioral health of our entire employees and, uh, and their family members as well. And that's really unusual. And, uh, and that, you know, I was in, uh, talking to Francis Lee about, you know, uh, about, uh, about some of the work that happened during the time of COVID. And uh, Francis Lee is, is a chair of psychiatry at Cornell who I, uh, who I trained and, and, and studied with. And, and Francis was saying, oh, we, 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 are, we, we started to provide this, uh, this uh, behavioral health support for the staff. Uh, and that was so well received, so innovative. And, 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 and as he was talking about it, I realized, wow, we've been doing this for the past how many years already? We just never talked about it. We never really presented it, uh, wrote, I mean, we wrote some about it, but it, we never really put an effort to develop it into a model to be able to present it out there. Other things that I'm proud of, okay, our coaching academy, I'm really proud of. But this, you know, brainchild of Susan McDaniel and Lauren DiCaprel, who supported from the, the residency coaching side and is now, you know, there's not a single residency program uh, that, that has clinical uh, side to it and that does not have a coach. If they don't have a coach yet, it's because they just haven't been able to get, uh, get uh, Susan to be able to help out because we, we already have 18 uh, coaches in 13 residency programs and across the University of Rochester Medical Center who are teaching communication skills, uh, teaching biopsychosocial model, and overseas quite often, often overseas their wellness in residency as well. And Susan also, along with others, provides physician coaching for those with who needs assistance after professionalism issues and et cetera. You know, we are very lucky to have this program in our medical center. And, uh, uh, and it's a model that we should also continue to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, spread out into the world. 
Our entire collaborative care and wellness division is actually quite unusual. Very few, if any, psychiatry department has this kind of division. But we actually have 40 faculty members involved, along with the 22 uh, PhD psychologists, primary psychologists, who provide you know, a lot of behavioral health support and, and, and embedded in, in, in all the way arranging from primary care, pediatrics, cancer, transplant neurology, chronic pain, neurosurgery, orthopedics, dermatology, women's health, cardiology, ophthalmology is something that I'm, we are planning to do. We used to also have a, a dental clinic, an embedded clinic as well, and that's something that we should get back to probably. That also makes us, if not the very unusual, at least the most integrated, uh, clinically speaking, uh, department in the country. Just quick, you know, advertisement. Uh, CCW division is having the eighth annual symposium, and it's not too late to sign. And and it's actually this Friday, so so please go ahead and sign. <laughs> Other programs that are testing the boundaries are heal programs that provides mental health and legal and social services for those with intimate partner violence. And this year, we also have recruited new faculty member, and we are very excited about developing trauma related programs, uh, firearms injury pro programs with Corey Nichols and Jennifer West starting this program during the last academic year. Deaf wellness program is very unusual, uh, but we are so proud of it uh, and continuing to invest in it. Uh, Lazarus Fertis and also Wish Clinic, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately Diane Morse will be changing her primary appointment to public health science but you know we still hold a contract, <laughs> and and then and, but but we wish her well, and and also uh, uh, also we would love to see the more people who are transitioning to criminal legal uh, from the criminal legal systems to get the primary care necessary. I don't know if you re remember. Some of you have seen the movie, uh, the animation movie, the robots in two thousand five. There's a character. Uh, a quirky inventor who talks about see a need and fill a need. And, uh, and that sort of became our department's model. When we saw a need, we did our best to fill it. And, uh, and we are probably going to do more and more. And part of it is related to how we worked so much in developing a permeable boundary. Overall, the traditional boundary of psychiatry have faded. To the degree now, a lot of people just approach us to, for help. And that's something that we have to kind of think about. Think about CPAP. A lot of people come because of acute need, but in reality, they also come because they have a crisis related to poverty, drugs, homelessness, crime, violence, relationship issues, and unemployment. And 80 or 90% of them get released back to the community after the CPAP stay. What should it do? Should, we, should our work be stopped once they are out of our sight? Or should we think about addressing some of these issues? Recently, I got particularly interested in hunger and food shortage related issue, and that's something that I'm, I'm beginning to look at. And uh, the role of psychiatry in our community is something that is beginning to really evolve. By the time I was talking to one of the trustees about the fact that we run a daycare program in our court system, and she was asking me, like, what do you not do? And that's a good question. What should you not do? Overall, I don't know if all of these things related to social determinants of health is something that psychiatry should be involved in addressing. But ultimately, you know, when you see someone, particularly with those with mental disorders, with dire needs in all of these things, how can we stop, especially when we are available, if we have resources or if we can create resources? And that's something that, that we are beginning to engage in. 
that I want to begin to engage in, in terms of value of psychiatry. I'll give you an extreme example. Beyond going to the value of our traditional value, but what about geographic boundary? And I'll give you a quick example. As Watini is uh, formerly known as Swaziland, by the way, it's slightly above South Africa, has a population of 1.23 million people, uh, you know, very little GDP, gross domestic product, and uh, it, it's still in monarchy state, believe it or not, they have a king. Uh, their health is incredibly poor. 25% of their population is you know, HIV positive. And access to HIV meds are very limited. And uh, they have, in 2011, they had one psychiatrist. And the problem is that they have no medical school whatsoever. The reason that I bring up is that recently I was contacted to work on a curriculum, psychiatry curriculum for the first medical school in Eswatini. And it's recruiting, you know, 17, 18 year old to go through a six year program to become a doctor. <laughs> it started by a couple of uh, a medical missionary from South Korea that I had known for a while. And uh, I, I, you know, I received the request, and how do I refuse? Uh, so we'll be providing lectures by Zoom by a variety of people around the world, and we're going to see how it goes. Spreading the word, uh, you know, the biopsychosocial model is also another thing that we all engage, and this is something that I was engaged. Many of our faculty members will be going to Tübingen in, in, in a few, a few, I guess, in a couple of weeks. And, and they'll be participating in the ICPM World Congress to talk about future of psychosomatic medicine. Uh, and I'll be also participating in it as the president of ICPM. You know, it's going to be a hectic travel schedule to go. I'll be in China in, in October to help a school develop consultation liaison service, and help career development of uh, people, uh, trainees in psychosomatic medicine. And, and also participate in Congress, the CSPM, Chinese Association of uh, Psychosomatic Medicine, actually has 20,000 members. So, so I'm looking forward to the plenary session in terms of what it looked like. And then I'll probably end that journey by stopping by Korea to celebrate the 50 year anniversary of Korea American Medical Association and really stress the importance of uh, mental health among Korean American immigrants that I've been working on for the past. 20 years. So the reason that I bring up these things is, again, thinking about what is the meaning of all this. And while I was composing this eulogy for my mother's funeral, uh, just last week, I was reminded of a book that a, uh, a friend of mine gave it to me when I was actually thinking about coming to Rochester. I was really torn. I was pretty happy at Yale and you know, very comfortable. And my son was in you know, good school and, and et cetera. And he gave me this book called The Road to Character written by a, a New York Times columnist named David Brooks. And some of you know, some of you probably don't like him and, uh, because of political leanings and et cetera. But it gave me really a pause when I was reading that book. Because he talked about how there are two sets of virtues. One is resume virtues, and the other is eulogy virtues. And that's probably why I remember this. The resume virtues are skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that they talk about at your funeral, whether you are kind, brave, honest, or faithful. And he talks about how eulogy virtues are far more important than resume virtues. And I was thinking about my mom and thinking about how she was a gift to everybody around her and thinking, wow, that, that's the kind of life that I want to live. Thinking about our careers and our work at, at University of Rochester Medical Center in the Department of Psychiatry, something we should think about, about the difference between career and vocation. And what David talked, uh, the Brooks talked about is a career is more about job and advancement and financial gain, and you can always switch. You know, if the value don't meet, then you can always switch. Vocation is more about calling, 
It's not about your fulfilling desires and wants or pursuit of happiness, but it's more about pursuit of meaning. It's about moral indignation, about, about our patients who still have a life expectancy of 60 in our country. Our patients with severe mental illness who has a life expectancy of 60 and how we should integrate to make that change and help them live longer and provide better services. We spend tremendous amount of time in our work. You know, it talks about how if you have a 40 hours a week along with some vacation time, about 30 to 40 percent of your waking hours are, you know, spent at work. An average person will spend 90,000 hours. Now, you know, somebody like me actually work about 60 hours a week, I think. And, and many of you do as well. And that means this is where we spend a lot of time. And, and this is where we should be thinking about finding meaning in, in your vocation, in your career, to really be happy. Because, because I found my career, my, my vocation at University of Rochester happy because I found meaning in it. And we should find ways to think about our values, how it matches with you, and how we can derive meanings in our career. And because it reflects who we are, uh, particularly as you think about the five C's, especially compassion and advocacy for our patients. There are other things that we talked about. We are a department of like-minded people. Because we advocate together for the vulnerable population. I put vulnerable population instead of severe mental illness because we keep expanding our focus on more and more. And I, I offer this as a, a way to, as a, as a prelude to think about uh, these values together. So overall, if I'm to summarize it, uh, you know, we, we continue to expand uh, despite uh, my plea for smart growth, and I'm proud of it. And we will, we have ambitious plan to fill the gap in education, faculty development, and mentorship. And with these expansion, we are continuing to test the boundaries of psychiatry. And interestingly, more success that we have, we are asked to do more and more, uh, lead more. We are recently are asked to lead a pain program development for the medical center. We are asked to really consider just really like thinking about how addiction program is done, despite the fact that we just started the divisions. We're getting a lot of requests from the community to help out with a variety of issues uh, in relation to social determinants, poverty, gun violence, you name it. And that's something that we should be proud of. And as you do that, you know, let's look at our values and let's think about how we can make our place, workplace more meaningful and also help each other in terms of fulfilling their career, uh, having, having more fulfilling job and career in our community of Department of Psychiatry. So thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Lee for um, both a very thoughtful and thorough reflection of our department, its growth over the last several years, and some hopes that you have, and I think many of us share for the year that we have ahead. I see all the cell phones coming out, so thank you in advance for filling out the evaluation. We do have some time for questions, for those of you who might have them, questions, reflections, curiosities. Bless you. I think you've left them speechless. <laughs> <clears throat> so with that, I will say thank you to Dr. Lee. Thank you to all of you for attending. If you are one of our learners, one of our trainees in the department, your next gig is here. So please go ahead and stay seated. Uh, as for the rest of us, we look forward to seeing you next week. Same time, same place. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Lee. Thank you, and it's just good to be home. Take care.